John Lindsay is from the is from the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. Recently moved there from University of San Diego's Institute for Cooperation and Conflict. Is there you go? Get it about right. That's right. Yeah, uh, and he's a political scientist. So we're moving. We're moving disciplines. Uh, well, thanks very much. It's wonderful to be here, especially since it's freezing in Toronto and it's fantastic here. Um, I'm going to be talking about a project uh, called Cross Domain Deterrence. Actually, it has a much longer name. Uh, it has a, a fairly large number of collaborators that are involved here. Um, and I'll try and emphasize the cyber aspects of this project. But this project had its origins in really thinking through uh, strategic interactions in cyberspace between nation states and other actors. Um, and uh, Eric Gartsky, the, the PI in this project at UC San Diego, and I were thinking a lot about cyber specifically and a lot of the wild claims that exist for the cyber domain. And, um, and a lot of these didn't quite make sense in uh, theories of modern war the way that we understand them. But when you started thinking about cyber in conjunction with other diplomatic and military instruments of power, suddenly you started to get into some really interesting materials. So uh, a lot of what was interesting about cyber had nothing to do with the cyber domain, but its interactions with other domains. So we're all pretty familiar with uh, the concept of deterrence. Of course, is Dr. Strangelove who tells us deterrence is the art of creating fear in the mind of the adversary, right? So it's about beliefs, it's about the future, it's about communicating credible threats to the other side, uh, either to get them to do something, compellence, or to get them to not do something that you would like them to not do, uh, deterrence. Um, but already, and we can pick lots of different uh, definitions, if you look at this uh, American military definition, you already see that there's a lot of different things that are going on in the concept of deterrence. Um, trying to uh, prevent an action, trying to create a belief, trying to talk about costs and benefits. So deterrence is actually a bundle of multiple things. It's going to be one of the primary themes that I want to stress here. Now, deterrence has been something that, uh, that Actors have been interested in and practicing since antiquity. Uh, you can find all kinds of uh, deterrent threats in uh, all kinds of ancient texts. But deterrence was always uh, liable to fail, and so military had to be ready to actually fight it out on the battlefield. They had to be willing to transition to defense or brute force, however you want to term it. Nuclear weapons are quite interesting because the first time they radically separate these two functions of defense, war fighting, and deterrence, communicating with force, right? Um, nuclear weapons were obviously costly, devastating. Um, nuclear weapons were also very difficult to defend against. There was always a non-zero probability uh, that a missile was going to get through and was going to do it quite quickly and with quite devastating results. So there was a necessity to start thinking systematically about the grammar of threat and the grammar <laughs> of communicating with nuclear weapons. And the important thing there is it's an advent of technology which is now separating Different functions that had already exist, but now have to be think, thought about um, in, in a different way. And of course, politics doesn't stop with nuclear weapons. We have a couple of hair-raising uh, chicken episodes with the Berlin crisis and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, but of course, uh, both superpowers start looking for other ways to influence one another, whether it's in the conventional domain, the subconventional domain, and proxy wars and other places. And there's the so-called stability and stability paradox emerges, where you have nuclear weapons preventing large scale superpower conflict, but you then have this expanding range of low-level threats that states can use to pursue their interests. Now this fellow is not as well known as, as Dr. Strangelove, perhaps he should be. Uh, this is Michael Nacht. He was Assistant Secretary of Defense for Global Strategic Affairs during the first Obama administration. He's one of our researchers. I just put this up to kind of highlight uh, his particular brief, which was U.S. nuclear forces, missile defense, cyber, and space. Michael looked at this and said, my goodness, how the heck do I manage this bundle of wildly difficult things? Um, especially when we've got some major challenges. And a lot of those challenges uh, focused on China at the time, right? China had just tested an anti-satellite missile. Uh, there's been a couple of more uh, that, that have, that have uh, gone up, it created a huge amount of debris in low Earth orbit. And Chinese started talking about ideas that they were going to escalate to de-escalate. They were going to uh, thought about in a militarized crisis, perhaps plinking a US satellite would be a, a way of demonstrating resolve. This comes to some of these cultural questions we were talking about uh, for US policymakers in that particular 
particular uh, track one dialogue, they started having heart palpitations because that is a big red line uh, when you start shooting down uh, US satellites. Of course, there was the growing uh, uh, use of cyber, Estonia, Georgia, um, Chinese activity starting to pick up. And it looks very, very difficult to deter this stuff. At the high end, worrying that some of that material may actually start to undermine the credibility of the US nuclear deterrent, which is, of course, tremendously dependent upon cyber technologies for command and control, for early warning, and for other such things. So thinking through a lot of these issues, it raises a lot of uh, questions that have been brought up, uh, uh, many of them particular to uh, cyberspace. Um, as I, uh, I don't know if I just mentioned this, but when we first started this project, this was really the China Space Cyber uh, Project, thinking about all these different means, but cyber was the real difficult one that seemed to undermine a lot of things that we uh, thought we already understood. So when we start looking at this systematically, cross-domain deterrence, our, our, our definition, our working definition, is just the use of apples and oranges, the use of unlike threats <laughs> to deter or compel uh, uh, action in a different domain. And this whole question of what is domain comes up all the time. Uh, the Pentagon's got kind of the big five war fighting domains. So I'll continue to talk about it a little bit more. We're just interested in things that are functionally different in some interesting way that they're going to have different political characteristics when you're bargaining and interacting. Just put up real quick uh, what the organization of this project works because it highlights uh, some of the different approaches um, that we've got going on. This is a five-year project. We're in our second year, uh, funded by the US Department of Defense uh, Minerva Initiative. Um, that's a, a, a little tiny pot of social science funding. Um, well, tiny for DOD, huge for social scientists. Uh, and uh, this is a partnership. Uh, this is focused at uh, UC San Diego. Um, we are uh, doing some uh, policy case studies. Um, it's kind of my, my brief at Toronto. Also working with Michael Nacht, who's now at Berkeley. Uh, we've got uh, two of the bomb labs, Los Alamos and Lawrence Livermore, working with us, uh, trying to model some of this. When we first started out, because this is the, the China Space Cyber Project, this is all about new technology. Uh, we thought, hey, we don't have a lot of history here. Uh, we're going to have to be modeling this to really think about how these dynamics worked. Well, once we started getting into this, we realized, hey, deterrent has always been cross-domain, right? It's one of these kind of nuclear moments where, hey, the introduction of nuclear means forced you to think explicitly about coercive bargaining. But when you start looking at every crisis interaction, there's always this variation across different means, right? Uh, so uh, the Spartans are really good in land power. The Athenians are not willing to meet them there. Uh, they want to drag the Spartans out into the sea. The Spartans don't want to go there. So you have a breakdown of cross-domain deterrence starting the Peloponnesian War. And cross-domain deterrence then keeps it prolonged in a sense, because both sides are trying to stick to their competitive advantage. And so uh, we've actually started off this big project to use both human coders and some machine learning techniques to go ahead and code, um, uh, I think we're looking at 500 different crises throughout the 20th century, so that we can look at the move and counter move and the chain of escalation and de-escalation as it modulates across these different domains and start to understand you know, under what conditions do domains matter, or under what conditions should having a bigger portfolio or a larger portfolio uh, matter. So, um, so we, we hope to have the empirical and the modeling side uh, lashed up, and we're just, we're just right now starting to do that. Okay, so uh, I want to I go over, at the risk of putting up math on the screen, which is always dangerous in an interdisciplinary audience, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the way that political scientists think about uh, the problem of war. Um, and I should say rationalist uh, political scientists. There's all kinds of interesting irrationalities in deterrence we can talk about in the QA if you, if you would like to. But um, the, the, the idea here is, well, when we look at war, there's a couple of interesting puzzles about it. And one of the big puzzles is, given that war is so costly, it kills a lot of people, it breaks a lot of things, it ruins governments, um, why do states and other actors ever get involved in war in the first place? It's a question that Tom Schelling asked. It's a question that uh, Jeffrey Blaney uh, famously looked at. Um, there should always be a deal that is better than fighting. Uh, it's a very similar question that comes up when you look at labor strikes. Uh, labor strikes are very costly both to labor and capital because you're not making anything and you're not getting paid, uh, and yet you're, you're, you're striking. Um, there should always have been a deal if they would have understood the longevity of that strike and the cost that both sides were going to absorb. There should have been a deal that they would have been able to, uh, uh, to come about. So the way that you think about modeling this, here's player A and player B. Um, and this P is the distribution of power between them, OK? Um, war is going to be costly. 
There might be some situation hackers that you know get some uh, positive utility out of hacking. Um, maybe there are some primitive cultures that might have had a positive utility for war. But in general, war is costly. So um, either side, uh, they're going to, you know, if they were to fight it out, they're going to have to pay some cost. And that cost opens up this bargaining range in the middle. So X could be any proposal that would be preferable to both sides rather than fighting it out. But the question is, where is that X actually going to be? Because of course, both sides uh, would like it to be uh, closer to uh, the other sides, right? They want to maximize uh, their utility. And, and herein is the problem. Uh, here is, herein is the beginning of the solution to this kind of problem. Okay. If there is a great deal of uncertainty about what the actual distribution of power is, what the estimate on both sides might be, what the costs associated, suddenly you can have this nice bargaining range start to not only contract, but actually go the other direction and have both sides start to see the value of war uh, greater than any possible other outcome. Okay, so if both sides start to see the, va the expected value of war as greater than the expected value of diplomacy, however they've gone through that estimative process, uh, then war starts to look attractive. So the, one of the counterintuitive counter uh, implications of this, this model of thinking is that uh, war itself is an information generating process. We all know that war causes a lot of uncertainty, fog of war, Clausewitz, all that. But in the modern bargaining model of war, uncertainty is a major cause of war. But the process of fighting reveals information, how committed each side actually is to this process, how much they care, how much they're willing to bleed and put, and, and put up with uh, in order to stay in that fight. And that will tend to push that instant estimate closer together. And as they start to separate, then you have the possibility to start to come to a deal. And this is why it is very, very hard to find any historical instances. There's about you know, uh, three or four that you can come up with clearly until you get into the, the ancient world, where you have decisive disarmament victories. Um, almost all wars end with some unsatisfying uh, limited accommodation and negotiation. And that happens because both sides understand that the further disarmament contests would be far too costly. Okay, so uh, if they can fix the information problem, um, that's one thing, but then there's also a credibility problem, right? Even if you've got an option for coming to an, ag an agreement in the middle, um, there still might be a problem. Maybe the balance of power is changing and each side realizes, hey, I better keep fighting today because the other side is getting stronger. And if I don't disarm this fellow today, uh, then uh, you're going to be in a bad situation in the future. So you can have a preventative motivation. Perhaps you've got agency problems, right? So uh, you, who am I dealing with? Big problem in a regular war, right? Are you actually talking to the right warlord? Um, or you know, uh, are they going to continue fighting even though you've made a deal uh, with somebody? So Commitment problems can also be uh, a major issue here. Um, and unfortunately, that means that limited war itself can be a form of stable uh, equilibrium where both sides might have a sustainable situation and expectations that they will continue to uh, do well in the future. So um, all of that background on kind of just talking about the modern theory of war is, it was, is our uh, entrance into this to say, OK, there's some of these different parameters are active. And we can start to expect that different means that are being introduced into this system are going to have different effects upon the distribution of power, estimates of that, what the cost might be, what your ability to credibly signal uh, might be. Um, so when we think about cross-domain deterrence and what is that, um, politics said, excuse me, uh, Clausewitz said that politics, uh, war, excuse me, is politics by other means. Um, that implies that there's already this this decision to pick war instead of diplomacy or something else as part of an ongoing bargaining process that continues throughout the process of war. Well, what happens when you have many means to choose from? Not just guns versus butter, but guns versus guns, and lots of other kinds of guns. Uh, under what conditions should you choose one or the other? So the important thing is to recognize that deterrence is not one thing. Deterrence is actually a bundle of different objectives. You're trying to get your way at low cost without a fight. Okay, uh, and, and people, when they talk about deterrence, uh, can often mean different things. Uh, U.S. policymakers, when they talk about deterrence, sometimes it's about controlling escalation. A lot of times it's talking about trying to persuade other countries to do something, but without actually having to pay the cost of what it would take to get them to, to give way on uh, their, their particular prerogatives. 
We can go out and break out a couple of these, right? There's this idea of influence, um, things that affect that P, the probability of victory in war. Now, there are lots of military means that can affect P, the distribution of power, but be terrible for this third one, signaling, okay? Um, it's the classic military commitment problem. Um, if the US would have known during the beginning of the Korean War that the Chinese were about to intervene with 300,000 uh, uh, red Chinese troops, uh, there's no way that the US military would have crossed the Yalu. Uh, but the Chinese couldn't make that known because if they said, hey, we're infiltrating a bunch of people through the hills, um, that suddenly would have become you know, the US Air Force's uh, newest bombing target. Okay, so in order to have a potent capability, you had to keep it secret. Well, that meant that there was a massive disagreement on what the distribution of power looks like. There's no bargaining range. It's impossible to make a credible signal, uh, even though you have influence to get your way if a fight does happen. Now, uh, cyber should really come to mind here. Um, everything in the cyber domain, most things in the cyber domain depend on deception. It's very difficult to clearly reveal that you're going to do something specific in the cyber domain. Um, and so uh, it tends to be good for influence, uh, good for intelligence, getting your own information, but very bad for signaling. Nuclear weapons, almost exactly the opposite. Uh, nuclear weapons are terrible for influence because uh, it's very hard to imagine situations uh, under which a nuclear war fighting situation would uh, revol result in anything called victory that you would like or understand. Uh, but nuclear weapons are fantastic for signaling. Okay, This is where they really come into their own. Um, there's different kinds of costs that are associated with it. And we could iterate through and talk about, um, and, and we do you know, do this in some depth, looking at, at different domains, both military and non-military, and rate them in different ways uh, uh, across these, these, these um, different desiderata. Um, just to kind of talk about a, a, a situation that we're all familiar with, you think about um, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin's use of little green men in the Crimean situation. Um, uh, NATO could have met that with putting boots on the ground in Ukraine. Wouldn't be militarily the best way to oppose a large-scale Russian invasion, but suddenly you would have uh, dead NATO troops if that were to happen. Uh, that, of course, would mobilize a large-scale response. Putting skin in the game is a great way to, to signal resolve. Instead, air power is sent to Poland, which is a fantastic way to blink Russian tanks and and manipulate that P variable. But the problem with air power and naval power is the things that make it really good at war fighting, its mobility, its power projection, also make it really easy to move it somewhere else. And so there are all kinds of questions about whether it will credibly be there uh, to use in the future. How much time do I have left? A couple of minutes. OK, great. Yeah. OK, so, uh, so part of the cross-domain problem uh, is thinking about <laughs> what the rock, paper, scissors problem looks like. Okay, uh, if, if, the, if the classic game during the nuclear area was chicken, right, two teenagers zooming towards another, figuring out who's going to blink, um, now we're looking at an ongoing sequence of, of interactions uh, where each side might be playing a different set of means. And there are also new means that are being introduced in the midst, uh, and there's a great deal of uncertainty about how those might interact and what the interactive playoffs uh, would potentially be. Okay. Um, so, let me just put this together real quick. Okay, so when we try and put all of these things, things together, um, uh, the, part of the problem is let's, we're looking at the increasing complexity uh, of means that are available, the uncertainty that those generate, but uh, there are different things that policymakers and the political level and military uh, commanders uh, think about when they think about complexity and uncertainty. Militaries tend to uh, develop a lot of new weapon systems focused on the problem of fighting and winning a war if it comes to that. So you have a, a diversification of a lot of different things, uh, layering on of command and control uh, institutions um, to, to, to deal with uh, those new systems, <clears throat> creates all kinds of management and power measurement problems. But interestingly, then once you take that and you put that into the political realm, you suddenly have new means not only for fighting a war, but for signaling, for doing all kinds of things short of war, for looking for influence, uh, for deterring in one level, uh, operating in another. Um, you have a great deal of complexity that happens in this set of bargaining interactions. And because now you have a worry that there's going to be uh, a bargain that's going to end up not to your favor, there is now incentives to start developing new things. So you have this complexity ratchet over time that is uh, we have militaries and other innovators that are trying to patch those holes, but in patching that, they're, they're presenting new opportunities 
for uh, political actors in those complex bargaining relationships. Okay, so uh, just to just to wrap up here, um, I'd say that cross domain deterrence has always been around. It's always been leveraging many means, but the diversification in that portfolio makes it more important than ever to figure out how CDD works. Um, and innovation, in many ways, is an unhandled exception in the existing set of institutions and policies that had protected this status quo. Um, this isn't just a cyber problem. We talked a little bit about uh, Little Green Men, but I'll mention this kind of wiretaps from the Fourth Amendment, right? So the Fourth Amendment uh, is put up in order to keep, you know, Paul's ancestors from coming to the door of these poor American colonists, um, breaking down the door, stealing their documents, uh, coming home. So there's this uh, search and seizure um, uh, protection. Well, suddenly you invent uh, uh, wiretapping capabilities. You're not having to go into somebody's house. You're not even necessarily taking their stuff because it's information. You haven't destroyed the information by taking it. But now there has to be a big judicial process of reinterpretation to say, OK, the Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable search and seizure actually applies to your communications, even though they're going outside of your property as well. Okay, so there's this constant reinterpretation that can happen in the legal domain, but it's also happening in the way that states and other actors put together their deterrence uh, policies. What that means is that even though we see all of these deterrence failures, uh, certainly in cyber, and we fear them in space, um, those are happening on the basis of uh, existing deterrence that is working, and there are major disincentives for going big. We're not looking at stability and stability, not just at the nuclear level, but also the conventional level. But you have a proliferation of ways to design around uh, those, those existing deterrents. So I will go ahead and uh, wrap up there. Um, I know we can go take this in a lot of interesting directions, but hopefully that gives you a flavor of what we're working on. John, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, John. A great presentation and a great project. Uh, the, as you describe it, the uh, thanks, as you describe it, uh, it could have existed before 1970 or before 1990. Uh, and you've got a very tantalising slide which says conflict is the price of information. So you open up the question of does information, does information age change everything, uh, fundamentally or just in part. Uh, but so apart from the philosophical considerations of how the information age might change uh, insurance. What's your database look like for, so you're going back to the Peloponnesian Wars for cross domain deterrence, what are your cases that you might look at in the cyber age where there's been a real engagement of cyber military power? Sure. Um, so th there's lots of things that, that we could potentially look at. I've looked at the, the Sony case uh, pretty closely, which is an interesting one because you've got some of these information uh, imperfections that are incentivizing that attempt at coercion. But coercion highlights exactly this problem that I was mentioning. As soon as the Koreans, you know, operating under their proxy guys as the, uh, uh, um, the guardians of the peace, start to make demands, now you've activated this large attribution effort. They're starting to cross lines. They're making, however, empty you know, terrorist threats. Uh, and suddenly, uh, there's a lot of effort that is put on solving that attribution problem. So attribution is a little less difficult when one side is highly motivated uh, to solve it and deal with it. Um, and it's the very act of trying to use cyber for coercive purposes that starts to become very uh, self, you know, uh, effacing, self undermining. Uh, so that's that's one case that we've looked at. Um, uh, with with our kind of experimental uh, projects, we're developing um, a set of games for both the South China Sea and a Baltic situation that will play with um, both professional uh, you know, military and policy folks that are dealing with these situations, and as well as some other experimental groups to try and populate the different ways that people value some of those political objectives uh, in all of the, the the means that are available, so that we can make sure that our uh, uh, our computational models are tracking along some sense of, of reality in the way that people actually think about some of these problems. But uh, you know that, 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 that ICB database has got you know, hundreds of different cases. So once we populate that with the new data set, uh, we're then hoping to look at some of the cases that are particularly interesting for the number of, of cross-domain interactions, um, and then go do slightly more qualitative deep dive into those. As a one sentence footnote, um, instead of considering the Sony case as not military, you might consider the impact on the United States military doctrine on global strike um, as, as, a, as a real case. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Interesting. You, you talked about costs and benefits. 
So I want to explore with you the concept of entanglement in, in cyber. The idea that, um, say, a state is deterred from a cyber attack because it sees as the perceived costs outweighs the perceived benefits of an of attack because of how integrated it is with the global economy. So um, in terms for a, a good deterrent strategy, in your opinion, what measures can the state um, implement to kind of increase the perceived costs of the other side of the world? Yeah, great question. Uh, and, and cyber deterrence has really gone through, I think, a major evolution in the last couple of years. If you look at U.S. declaratory policy, say around 2011, it basically says, hey, deterrence by punishment, inflicting consequences afterwards, uh, is not really feasible in cyber because of the attribution problem and offense dominance. Uh, so we're going to have to focus on deterrence by denial, having good defenses. Fast forward to 2015 policy, and suddenly deterrence is back in vogue again, right? So there's a lot of discussion that, you know, uh, large-scale cyber attacks on unspecified target set um, will result in the consideration of consequences not limited to the cyber domain, lots of other things. So a willingness to start thinking through uh, a lot of that. So uh, when we model the cyber domain, it's interesting is that you've got this, um, this real inflection point where you've got a great deal of offense dominance and, and things that are very difficult to to deter, partially because it's easy for uh, threat actors to do things, and partially because there's a lack of resolve on the defense side to really secure those kinds of targets. So you have a great deal of activity on the low end. But as you start to move to more complex and more valuable targets, um, all the activity falls off, and deterrence starts even theoretically to become far more feasible because the attacks are more costly, it's more likely you're going to make mistakes, the attribution problem becomes uh, much easier. So you have this inver inversion where with the targets that you actually care about, cyberspace starts to look a lot more defense dominant than people normally expect. Which means you're having to accept that, okay, deterrence in cyber is not going to be a one size fits all. You're going to have to figure out what kinds of targets are, are actually worth defending and what kinds of targets are actually worth making some of those commitments. Um, and, and recognizing that clear commitments are going to incentivize an approach right up to that. So you're going to have to decide, do I want to deter wide or do I want to deter effectively? So I think starting to disaggregate the cyber domain into different kinds of activities, different kinds of targets, you're going to see that that deterrence conversation becomes more nuanced. But the good news is that deterrence is feasible for the things that you really care about. But, it's, but in order to make it work there, you have to accept failure everywhere else. I thought, the, I thought the preliminary results might be interesting enough to a, a group like this for us to, uh, to at least start, a, start an interesting conversation. The issue started a couple of years ago when we were, talk, when we were scoping our, mo our modelling framework uh, for this, the statecraft strategy and statecraft in cyberspace program where we're, and I'll talk more, more about that, um, that larger modelling framework uh, on Thursday. But this particular piece of work came about when, because we, we were energised about the issue of balkanisation in, in cyberspace. These were, the, these were the people involved in that conversation. Nathan Ryan, who you met earlier. Adrian Letchford is a postdoc uh, who's, uh, who was a student of Terry's who's now gone to the University of Warwick. And Dmitry Brishnev, who's sitting in the audience, is... Uh, is uh, uh, working with us on the on the project at the NSC. He's a st he's a student in the physical sciences. Okay, so I'll set this. I want I want to do this quickly. I want to just set the scene. Why this is a problem. I want to show you a very interesting result. Very interesting result. Surprising one. And then I want to show. And then I want to uh, talk about why what the policy implications of this could be. Uh, so as I said, work in progress. So. Governance in general of the internet is a complex, divisive, and contested issue, as John was as John was talking about it. The problem is, if we get it wrong, we'll kill. We could kill the greatest engine and generator of wealth and innovation since the invention of the steam engine. So we really do. We, this is a high stakes game. <coughs> we want to keep the internet, cyberspace open and free with very, with very light regulation so that in principle any individual or any machine anywhere on the planet can connect 
free of intervention, free of regulation, free of government interference and snooping to any other individual or machine on the planet like that. That's not how some authoritarian regimes would, would like. They would like, to, they would like these channels to go through some sort of government box and then across to another government box in another country and then be distributed out to the citizenry. Um, kind of, kind of uh, they, they do it for all sorts of internal reasons. Usually, usually the security of their regimes, they feel very threatened by open flow of information. Whereas in the West, we feel empowered by the open flow of information. But the issue is, could the internet go like that? Could it, could it change? So we don't like, we in the West, don't like the idea of a balkanised internet. We call this balkanisation, um, where, where the internet is fragmented up into territorial sub-internets, such as China is trying to do with its great power rule and, and so forth. And, but, from a complex systems point of view, it's a whole of system process organization. You're doing something to the whole process. And when you fiddle around with the topology of a system, you can generate critical processes that you don't fully understand. You could generate tipping points. Terry's going to talk later this morning about, about some other work on tipping points. Tipping points are where things are just going along, trundle, 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 pretty much the same as they always were, and then suddenly they change and move, to, and move the system to a different state. Um, there, there's interesting work on how you predict these things. There's interesting work on whether the, whether the state that succeeds the previous state uh, is stable or not. There's a whole lot of things. Classic examples of the tipping points were the, um, the 2008 uh, Great Financial Crisis. Uh, and there's, there's, uh, there's there's, there's a raft of others. They don't only occur in socioeconomic systems, they occur in ecosystems, they occur in brains, uh, they occur in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in transport networks, when, when you get a traffic jam, that's a, that's a similar sort of process, and so forth. So what we were asking was, could you, could you, make an, could you balkanise an, uh, uh, an, an internet? Would it be more or less stable than today's internet is? Um, and if it was balkanised, could you unwind it and get it back? If, if somehow it went bad, from our point of view, could we debalkanise it? So what we did, we did some modelling. We used, we used simple networks. We know, we know a lot about the, about the shape, the, the topology of cyberspace, the type of network it is. And we know a lot, of, and we know a lot about networks now. Um, in the last 10 or 20 years, there's been a lot of a lot of work on networks of all types uh, under, the, uh, under a general umbrella of complex systems thinking. We, we know about the behaviour of them, we know how to model them, we know some of the properties that come out from them, we know these sorts of networks do this, those sorts of networks behave like that. So what we wanted to do was to build, um, to build uh, a little toy internet, one that had the same characteristics as, as, as real cyberspace, and to see whether it, what its behaviour would be like if we did things to it, and then to test, and then to see whether those results were general enough that they could be applied to the real to the real space. So the models were minimally realistic but sufficiently general. So we do this because we're dealing with a singular phenomenon. There's only one internet. There's only one universe. There's only one solar system. It's very hard to do experiments on things like this because you can't replicate it. So science has to model. Science can, can get its knowledge in three ways, through observation, which is sometimes good, but often not sufficient. Darwin did, did a pretty good job just with observation, so, but Newton had to resort to experiments. You can use experiments, that's another way, where you constrain a lot of things and manipulate things. And the third way of trying to understand, understand the world from a scientific perspective is to, is to simulate it, and then do your experiments on the simulation. Now that's, being, that's useful in cosmology, we learn about we learn about the uh, the beginning of the universe and and the unfolding and the unfolding of the universe from the Big Bang onwards through vast, really clever, really subtle simulations because we can't go back and do it, and we can test some of the results of the simulations from observations we make about the universe today, or indeed the universe in the deep past because we can still get signals from the deep past. So that's the sort of that's the sort of approach we're taking to this. 
we try and build a minimally realistic model, try and, and then test it against observations we can make on the real internet to see how general it is. So observation is not, is not sufficient. You can't just think this stuff through because your brain isn't clever enough to, to handle the complexity of something like cyberspace or indeed the universe. So what we did was grow, we know how the internet grows and we know it grows by a thing called preferential attachment and that process leads to a thing called a scale-free model, a scale-free graph. That's all the tech we're going to talk about now. Um, all that means is that if, I'm, if, I, if I've got a box and I'm wandering around wondering where to plug it into in the internet in some, in some metaphorical sense, I, I plug it into, on average, somewhere where more other, more other people have plugged previously than a place that's never been plugged into before. So there's a bias towards plugging things into things that are already receiving a lot of plugs. And that's all preferential attachment means. And that gives the structure of the internet we, as we see today. So we did that, built a little model, allowed the nodes of this thing, threw a whole lot of nodes into a, into a computer, and said, nodes, you can, com you can connect to other nodes, and you connect progressively to nodes that are already connected to more nodes. You have a bias to do that rather than connect to, uh, to other sorts of nodes. And we get something like this. Um, this is um, a scale-free network, classic, a, a, a classic description of something like the internet. This has got a couple of hundred dots in it. Now, we've got the dots in two classes. We've called one class of dots countries. They're the, they're the ones that, that, um, that aren't coloured in. And the, other, and the other dots are other, i.e. not countries. And you can see that people aren't connecting to countries necessarily and countries aren't necessarily connecting to countries. It's all random, but preferential. And that's the way the internet looks roughly today. Um, of course, on a much faster scale. And you can do this thousands of times and get average properties of a process like this. And, and what we're doing at this stage. And then what we did, having got it to grow like that, we then allowed threats to pass between those nodes, along those little lines. And the threats will pass from node to node. And if, if a node had a certain level of threat, it would say, I don't like being connected here. And it would disconnect and then look for another node to connect to. Um, and in the hope that it was going to, get, get, was going to be uh, subject to fewer threats. And, and there'd be a cost of doing that, but there would be a gain from, the, um, there would be a gain from, uh, from being released from this channel of threats that were coming down. So we did that, and we ran that, and we could see that the things just kept going. Things would disconnect, they'd reconnect, and we continued to get what's called a scale-free network. The internet still looked the same. As long as, you, as long as those threats just kept coming, people would disconnect, you'd give up on this ISP, go to another one if you want to think it like that. And, that was the, and that's the sort of evolution you got. But then we allowed countries those little, those little dots, that subset, a handful of entities in this net, to modulate the threats. They said that if a threat comes through me, I can, I can turn it down, I can do something to it, I can lower it. So, but, but you'll have to pay a cost. So if you, if, you're, if you chance to be connected to me, you won't have so many, you won't have so many threats coming down, your, down, the, down the pipe, but it will cost you a little bit. Um, you'll have some work that you have to do. That's OK. And we did this thousands and thousands of times, and we did it in all sorts of ranges of possibilities, the numbers of countries and the numbers of nodes and the levels of the threats and the levels of the costs, just to see how, how this sort of work passed out for a wide range of things. So I'm showing you average conditions or sample conditions from this, but the results I'm showing you are quite general. So what happened was, when this modulation reached a critical value, when a country could start to, could start to uh, modulate a threat sufficiently strongly to stop a threat coming through, we had a critical phenomenon occur. We had a tipping point, and I'll show you this. <coughs> and this was, this, this was quite interesting. What happened was, here's the probability of stopping a threat by a country, going from doesn't, doesn't actually care, threats got pass through a country node, 
through to any other node. It just passes them on, passes them on. Here it's starting to, here it's starting to do something uh, with them. Here it's trying to stop them. Here it's, and here it stops all threats. What you found was that what we call balkanization, which was how often countries, the other nodes, the nodes that weren't, that weren't countries, started to tuck in behind countries. The rate at which, so here they're, they're assembling behind countries and they're not, and they're going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Once you get to this point, when, when countries have becoming quite effective at, at knocking back, knocking back uh, threats, all the other nodes tuck in behind, behind the countries with a great fidelity. Now, don't worry about the exact numbers. They're irrelevant. The thing is the shape of that. There's a tip, it's a tipping phenomenon. It's not, it's not to do with the particular values of the parameters. It's to do with this broad qualitative process that's going on. That if countries start to behave like this, non-countries will start to tuck in behind them very bloody quickly. So we, so we get a balkanised network. And suddenly, the network looks like this. These are the countries. Everyone tucks in behind a country. And the, connection, the main connections in the graph, the main connections, the backbone of the internet, suddenly becomes from country to country to country to country to country. And that's a very, very robust and strong result. That happens again and again and again. So countries don't have to do much to uh, and you can see this in a dynamic simulation. Let's see. Okay, so here's countries are in red. This is gradually increasing the number of um, the number of uh, uh, ability to stop threats. And you can see, uh, as uh, in this representation, as uh, as entities get more connections, we allow them to grow bigger. So you can see them. So what started out just as a random as a random process over time starts to balkanize so and it continues and continues then it slows down and the other thing that happens is that it's then stable it doesn't unbalkanize as you continue the process this thing goes on and on and on and it just starts to lock down you see the odd one trying to find a new home but nearly always the new home is behind a country it stabilizes and becomes more solid now that's a really interesting result. That goes on for thousands of steps. I won't show you them all, but you can see it's got this lovely little network, which started out just like the network we, we had to begin with, has now become balkanized. Just by having that tweak in how things, in how states manage their, inter their relationships to threats in this case. Threats, and we're talking about threats in the, in the most general uh, character here. Now, so this happens over a wide range of settings and over the, when we do it with thousands of countries or, or thousands of nodes and hundreds of countries, when we do it with tens of nodes, tens of countries and hundreds of things, same, same result. It's a general result about the behaviour of the internet and different types of threats. Okay, so what? All that's really good academic fluff. Here's, here's the take home message. Firstly, the internet we have, we've got by happenstance. It is not, it's free and open and wonderful, but it's not safe. Um, we, we didn't get there by careful planning. We got there because a bunch of geeks in Los Alamos and places like that declared it to be like that to begin with, and it kind of kept going. The other thing, the other take home message is very small and simple changes in the ways that countries behave can lead to changes in the global structure of the internet. Not by fiat, not by international, in international negotiations, just by their own individual behaviours. They can drive a global change in the internet, in the internet structure. And once it's organised, it's very hard to nudge it out. You can't undo that. Um, an app comparison is the difficulty the world has had in creating global free trade. We had quite good global free trade before the First World War and, and the Edwardian period, and that slowly got eroded, and we've been trying ever since to come back to a global free trade system, an open, free network, and we just can't do it. Thanks, Terry. I'm winding up. So, 
here's, here's, here's the message for us. We've got to work hard and smart and long just to keep the internet we've got. Chi the Chinas and Russias, they can just wait because the balkanized internet's coming to them. They can just wait for any slip-ups, any changes, any, any changes in behavior, and a balkanized internet's going to drop into their laps. The policy ramifications of that are enormous. We behave in our international negotiations as if we're talking about uh, a structure which itself is stable, which we need to prevent from, we need to make rules about to prevent it from um, going the bad way. Our strategy needs to be exactly the opposite. We need to protect this thing and prevent it, and prevent it unveiling its tendency to balkanise very quickly. Uh, and that, that's, the, that's the story. One, I get a challenge to one of your initial assumptions, and then one question about balkanisation. The challenge is, you said, um, you know, we in the West, we don't like this balkanisation thing, we want to keep things free and open. Um, the challenge that I've got to you there is, I know, at least a couple of years ago, Facebook, for example, were wanting balkanisation on the internet. They were advocating uh, internet log on ID for each person, etc., etc., basically so they could control access to the internet. Yeah, so the relevance of this is, have you looked at and or will you be looking at the role of non-state actors in these things, assuming or given that they have different motivations for states? So Facebook's motivations are going to be different to, say, Australia's motivations. So would you look at that and do you think that would have an impact? Oh, that's true. On these? That's, yeah. a, that's a very good point. Um, when I said the West would like to, you know, there are, there, are, there are parts of the West, I hope the majority, that would like to keep it free and open, but some, some governments are getting gulled, some Western governments are getting gulled into, into thinking that a balkanised internet may not be such a bad yeah. thing for their own security. Yeah. Uh, and there, and they could get, they could get gulled by, um, by the Chinas and Russias into, into sort of collaborating to, to create something like that. And I think that would be really dangerous. One of the things we've seen in some, in some Western countries, the US, Australia, is reducing the number of portals for, government, for, for governments as a security measure. But then you can bet a whole lot of governmental um, and, and uh, parasitic uh, organisations would, would try and tuck in behind that to, for their own protection. And then people want to tuck it on. That could be very. That could be a cascading problem inside Western countries too. So yeah, um, it's a it's a problem, and we need we need to defend what we've got. We, we've created by happenstance this fabulous thing, and it, and it could get it could get snatched away very quickly by a few stupid uh, policy um, responses. Uh, yeah. So very quick follow up then. Um, and maybe you don't want to or don't have to answer this, but what's wrong with balkanisation? So why should we be so right? You can't get, you can't, be, because the innovation that we get out of the internet and uh, just just won't occur when things are bolted down through through government agency of one sort or another. And there's there's a general, it's the libertarian in me, the idea that that we can freely interact with our fellow human beings Without uh, without a government intervention, I think is is broadly, ethically a good thing, and 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 that sh and this is the first time it's happened in the history of the planet, and we should encourage it, not um, not knock it back. I'm a little bleeding Democrat, aren't I? Sorry. <laughs> We've been discussing this for several years, and it's really amazing to see it in in, in such a. Um a well presented form, particularly that kind of Ebola virus thing. Yes. Um, as Terry just said, in, um, we were chatting, it, it, it does tell its own story very powerfully. Um, and and what, what's powerful about it, I think, is that it, it, I think for a long time people have just, when we spoke about organisation, we just assumed it meant a, a sort of the degrading of the internet, when in a sense it does, or a weakening of the internet. But actually, what it is is arguably a very robust alternative to it, and that's mm. what makes it such a challenge. Mm. But my question, I, mean, I was going to read off your last slide but then disappear, so this is oh. no. I think you wrote that the internet they want will just drop into their laps. And this is something I'm going to talk about tonight. And I, I see what you mean, but in a sense, they want two internets. They want the one they've got at the moment. Mm. But they also know deep down, if you really probe, that they want the other one too, the one that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So how do, we, how do we play that? Yeah, can we have, can we have a world where there's uh, a big free and open space yeah. and a bunch of 
and a bunch of balkanized spaces in Russia, China, Iran, and so forth that are somehow connected to this larger, um, more, I don't know. Um, that's, that's, that's beyond the power of a simple model like that and certainly be one to, one to have a look at to see whether that would, prop, whether that would propagate, whether the, yeah, it, it would be interesting to model. I have no idea how it would go, uh, but it would be a challenge to have a look at. Yes. Um, how do IP policy settings interact with that phenomenon? I'm sorry? How do IP policy settings interact with that phenomenon? IP... Intellectual property policy settings. IP intellectual property, not internet protocol. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. You can see, you can see some governments might even see uh, balkanising the internet as a way to protect their IP. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. This model was... This model was trying to look at the high-level structure of, the, of cyberspace rather than rather than delve into those things, and I think you would need you would need to elaborate uh, models to, to to get at questions like that. And in fact, uh, models like this are set up to then be elaborated for particular questions. Uh, yeah, so I, don't know. I think I need some more uh, interpretation of the model, as I understood it. The non-state players are the fearful ones rushing behind the states for protection. But that seems to me the opposite of what, what is actually occurring with, say, the, the Great Firewall, um, where it's the, it's the states who are, uh, who are threatened and they're uh, trying to deny their, their populations, or the, the non-state actors within their jurisdiction, Access to the rest of the system. Yeah, that's 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 also a way of doing it within that within that right. space. The, mod the modelling for that would, would require um, the uh, non-state actors to be actively trying to get to get out of the yes, system. Yes, yes. But we 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 chose for this little for this little toy uh, effort not to, not to look at that. Just to look at. Just to look at how it would spontaneously, what would happen if you if you just empowered states to the, to um, to be uh, to be able to control uh, threats better than they do. So yeah, yeah, but it's a good point. I'm just interested to know if you had any factors in the model that actually either didn't result in balkanisation or at least slowed it down um, that might inform a strategy to keep the internet open. Mm. No. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we we kept one of the one of the things that this toy model conceptual about is to keep things as simple as possible. Keep the number of parameters down um, and keep so we just had threats and costs. Uh, costs of servicing the servicing the threat as it were. Uh, and some notion of do you become poorer or richer if you're whacked or whacked about the ears all the time. Um, and, and those are very abstract they were very abstract concepts and we could set we could set them to large or small, or or what it, or, or what have you, and we we continued to get that sort of behaviour. So it wasn't it wasn't that deep. Uh, we're trying to get the general behaviour, and then we hand it over to you policy guys and say, okay, <laughs> would you like? Where do you want to go now? <laughs> now that we've given you this steaming cow pad, <laughs> where do you where do you take your? Uh, let's talk about further how we might change the policy settings in some way. Uh, what would be what would be the killer thing that would that would allow that to switch that off that process, which would which would clearly advantage the West and maintain the system as it were. Uh, we haven't searched for that, uh, and that's a that's a that's a process that you engage in a dialogue with with, uh, with policy people to find out the sorts of things that might be feasible. Let's try it. So yeah. So it seems to me there is an optimistic interpretation, actually, that is totally consistent with the, the assumptions of the model. If we call the little white notes firms instead of states, and these firms have the power to build better software to mitigate those threats, then you might end up in a world where users flock to a few firms that have massive network effects, and others get selected out. And it kind of looks like a world that has a Google and a Microsoft and an Apple um, that has actually inoculated itself against it other smaller entities that are coming in here. So maybe if those are firms that are in control of the architecture of the internet, it might actually be locking out some of these more state-centric yeah. solutions. Yeah. yeah, although when you think about the success Google has had in 
uh, getting a toehold in China, um, it may not be a global solution, but it's a, it's a very good point. It's a very good point. Look, I think we'll have to wrap up that.